Okay, thanks for joining everyone. This is the second installment of Finance and um, I do need an introduction music. That'd be fun. Finance and Investing. I'm Martin Scully. I have two wonderful finance students joining us and a fellow uh, finance expert, Quinn. And we'll be going through, uh, we'll be sort of picking up where we left off on the last lesson. We, uh, when we, let's recap that, I guess, very briefly. We spent some time talking about investing basics. I gave you my life story and sort of how I came to decide that I wanted to learn something about investing in finance and sort of the path that I took. We talked a little bit about how to accomplish your goals in finance and investing. Um, I think probably the biggest takeaway is that finance is at best a full-time uh, job and at worst is often a full-time job that you still can't uh, do very well at, which is kind of a very sobering uh, and difficult thing to recognize is that most people who try to be great, become great investors fail. Um, and that's something that's sort of difficult and necessary to kind of learn early. Um, we talked about returns. Uh, we'll probably talk about those a little bit more, how the greatest investors make 20% uh, returns per year. And those are very, very, very far and few between. Um, even a 10% return every year is an enormous success. Um, so being realistic about how much you can actually compound your, your wealth into is important and recognizing that fees are probably the best, uh, the best way to make money as an investor is to invest other people's money. Uh, we talked about uh, some introspective kind of uh, attitudes towards self-improvement. Uh, we talked about some great investors of the past and studying them and learning from them. We talked about a few resources in finance, whether it's financial journals uh, textbooks, books like Seth Klarman's Margin of Safety or Phil Fisher's Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, some of the things that I've liked. And then we finally sort of left off on asset classes where we decided we'd focus on equity. And that's kind of, you know, where we left off. We looked at um, the six things that I look at anytime I look at a, 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 an equity or security. Uh, I look at the stock price, the shares outstanding, the market cap, the cash, the debt, and the enterprise value. And I know that the enterprise value concept confused a lot of people and it, it that's probably a good thing it, it, it should confuse you it takes some time to sort of think that through uh, we talked about financial statements and we kind of left it off there we we spent uh, um, not as much time as I would have liked on financial statements so that's kind of where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time here today and um, you know it's gonna be a little dry a little boring but I, I I'm not gonna sugarcoat a lot of finance is as we like to say, uh, Quinn would know this term well, plugging and chugging. And uh, that is a, uh, a understatement that a lot of your time in finance is spent sifting through hundreds of companies looking for the one you want to invest in or, or in any case bank in or, or whatever you might want to do with your career. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the biggest company in the world. Uh, we're going to um, look at Apple. So we're going to go to my favorite website, which is uh, the SEC's website, in all irony, um, and it's the uh, SEC search page. And I think that uh, if you go here, I actually made this my bookmark for a long time. Um, it's, it's the SEC's website for SEC filings. So if you type in Apple stock ticker, it's AAPL, you can get all of their SEC filings. Now, this, all this gibberish may confuse you, but I'll quickly sort of show you what some of it means. In 8K, is a disclo any disclosable event, basically. So any big news, any disclosable, I'm having trouble with the English language here, any disclosable event. And so what's disclosable? And this actually has been a topic in the news lately. So any kind of material, material means important, right? Any material event. And that you'll get to know kind of what that concept is. So that's what the eight Ks are. Uh, a lot of these are, are Kind of confusing. The 13G or D is a ownership statement. So if someone owns more than five percent of your company, that's what a 13G is. So all of these are, are specific, specific kinds of statements. And the ones we're concerned with are the 10Qs and 10Ks. The 10Q is the quarterly earnings report, or the quarterly report. It's more than just earnings, I guess. And the 10K is the annual report. So we use these. Not only these, but we start off with these Form 10 filings as our important kind of things we're going to focus on. So anyway, let's see the most recent 10 filing. If you see it for yourself, it's, it's the 127, January 27th, 2016 10Q. 
and we're gonna click documents and we'll click the first link, which brings us to the 10Q. And this is Apple's earnings report. So you can, you can use this same procedure. You could use the same procedure for, and, and there's the link if you had trouble opening it. You could use the same procedure for looking up any public company's uh, financial reports. So you can look up how much money Ford made last quarter, or how much revenue Pfizer had last year, or any company, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, or Outback Steakhouse, or whatever tickles your fancy. And you can see on Apple, you see the little Apple logo, and you see on page two and page three, you can see what their sales were. So sales of $75 billion for the three months ended December 26, 2015. That's a lot. Um, I think they're the one of the highest revenue producing companies in the world, $75 billion. So what do we do with this information? How do we interpret it? We, we're gonna use the what I call the Holy Trinity. Uh, if, you're, if you don't know uh, Catholicism, I was born in, uh, as, a, as a Roman Catholic and we have something called the Holy Trinity. So you have a new Holy Trinity in this class, which is the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Uh, and this is the income statement. And we're gonna learn that well. And you can actually abbreviate it pretty easily as IS, BS, and CF. Income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. And the three of them uh, come together to sort of portray the results of a company for any given period. And you need all three to really interpret a company's performance and all three kind of tell you slightly different information. We typically focus, especially as beginners, on the income statement and the balance sheet. The cash flow statement's a little bit advanced. It's still very important. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it isn't. Um, but anyway, we're gonna spend a lot of time in the income statement and the balance sheet and we'll end up looking at the cash flow statement in future courses. So let's try to interpret um, the Apple income statement. What I like to do is I like to go to Excel and like I said, I like to look at those six things first and foremost. So the stock price of Apple, and where do we look up stock prices? We can go to Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg Finance. Or I like Yahoo Finance. And uh, you don't need live stock quotes. I think Yahoo gives you live stock quotes for free, but you, you can invest uh, the, the same way people did in the old days. You can get a stock quote every, every three or six hours. You don't really need to know the stock price any second. I think that's a big waste of time, in fact. Um, so anyway, the stock price is about $97. And the number of shares, the number of shares Apple has is on the 10Q and it's on the first page. It says right there, 5.5 billion shares of common stock as of January 8th. So I'm gonna type in 5544.583 and that's for the fourth quarter, sort of corresponds at the end of the fourth quarter of 2015. And the market cap is obviously the product of the two. If you have uh, something that you're splitting into any a number of units, whether you're splitting a pizza pie into uh, slices, and each slice, you have 10 slices, and each slice is 10 bucks, well, the whole pizza costs $100, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the same thing with Apple. Apple has decided to split its company into 5.5 billion equal parts, and each part trades on the, the stock exchange right now for about $97. So all of the parts of Apple together cost about $537 billion, which makes it the most uh, expensive or most valuable, better way to put it, most valuable company in the world. How much cash does Apple have? I saw someone tweet at me the other day. Well, where would we find that? We don't find that on the income statement. It's on the balance sheet. Remember, the balance sheet is the, literally the statement of balances. It's how much cash balance they have. It's how much debt balance they have. It's how much accounts receivable balance they have. It's how much balance uh, on any given subject they might have. So anyway, we go to the uh, balance sheet and we see the first item is cash. And is that normal? Is that how this thing works? It is. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the way balance sheet works, and this is sort of the, in, in the PowerPoint, is the way balance sheet works, it's listed in order of liquidity. It's an order of liquidity. And what does that mean? Well, the most liquid thing, liquidity is just how fast can you convert it into cash? And cash is the most liquid thing. You can use cash to buy something. You can't use a house to buy something. You might have a $5 million house, but you can't buy groceries with it. The grocer will look at you and say, I don't want your house. I want $15 for these beers you're trying to have, Mr. Shkreli. I hate when that happens. But the, uh, the, um, the liquidity is, is just conversion to cash. So cash comes first. And um, the next most liquid thing to cash is marketable securities that are cash-like. So things like treasury bonds, even some stocks and things like that, 
are marketable securities. So if you had, let's say, a balance sheet of $5,000 of cash, $3,000 of marketable securities, well, what's next? Accounts receivable is next. So this is money that people owe you, owe your company for product that you've sold to them. So uh, this is stuff like if, if Apple, who presumably they ship their computers or their devices to a company, let's say like AT&T, and they say, here's 15,000 iPhones, pay us within 30 days. And you may not realize as a beginner or someone who hasn't been in the business world that that's how business is done. Uh, you might think that's crazy because you, you can't go to the Gap and say, well, I'll just take these 30 sweaters and I'll just pay you when, I'll pay you when I can. Uh, that's not the way that it works at the Gap, but in real business, that is the way it works, um, believe it or not. Uh, you usually pay within 30 to 60 days in American and most of international business. And that's called, uh, we usually like to say net 30, and there's a discount for paying early, and there's all these accounts receivable terms. But what about, what about sometimes when you have customers who don't pay? And that happens quite a bit. We call that bad debt. And accounts receivable is actually listed as net. So it's net of bad debt. And you have to estimate what you won't collect on, and literally what you have to send to accounts receivable, which is the or collections agency. So anything after 60 days, typically, you, you would discount that in your accounts receivable. So if you, this company that I'm, this sort of pretend company that I'm making up here, they might actually have $2,500 of receivables, but because some of that, maybe $500 of that um, is 90 days past due or 60 days past due, you'd start to like write it off of your, of your balance sheet. You'd start to say, well, I'm not gonna get that money from that customer, and hopefully you don't do business with that customer again, but you, you typically, or you sue them or something, but you typically have to write off the bad debt expense. Next is inventories. So inventories is pretty complicated, and we'll treat this over several lessons, but inventories is basically goods that you have that you're hoping to sell. And inventories can include all kinds of things like raw materials. Raw materials like if, if you're, I don't know, Apple, you might, you might end up buying a lot of glass. You know, then that's a raw material. And you're gonna turn that glass into an iPhone, but it's certainly not an iPhone when you buy the glass. And you're buying this raw material and you're converting it into your finished product. So you have raw materials and finished products. So of course Apple has iPhones sitting there on the shelf waiting to be sold. Those are finished products. And then in between they have something called WIP, which we call work in progress. And that's like a half finished iPhone or something like that. So after inventories, we get all into all kinds of crazy other assets. And the most important one, we're gonna call PP and E, property, plant, and equipment. And this is gonna this is gonna end up playing a huge role in finance. So just keep this in the back of your hand, back of your mind. Property plant equipment is any hard asset. It's any hard asset which has a useful life, which has a useful life of more than what? Do you guys know, students? No, I'm not sure. Ooh. Quinn, no. do you know? Oh, it's man. It's working. 12 months. It has to be a useful life of 12 months. So any building, any land, for instance, property, plant, and equipment, any factory, any, like if you bought a, uh, a machine, like, a, I don't know, some kind of, uh, if you're an Apple, I guess, uh, some kind of widget that makes iPhones, a big, uh, a big factory machine that, uh, I don't know, puts the iPhone together uh, that costs you $20 million to make. That's plant. That's literally property, plant, and equipment. And that's a really important part when it comes to accounting, it turns out to be extremely vexing and how we deal with it and tricky and quite important. So any, any good that is gonna have a, its utility, it will be measured in more than one year. A paperclip doesn't have utility in more than a year. A paperclip is, you use it when you use it. Um, but even computer software, if you buy a five-year license for computer software, you could actually have uh, a useful life of five years. And the way you account for that expense is very tricky. And it, it turns out there's a lot of accounting uh, questions and, and even sometimes accounting fraud that occurs when you misaccount for how uh, a useful life of an asset uh, is. So property, plant, equipment are, are very important in business and we'll, we'll talk all about it. So we have other assets, things like that. And the point is that as we go down on the balance sheet, we of course add this, to, add this all up to get to total assets. We get a sum here of total assets. But as we go down the balance sheet, it becomes less and less liquid. Cash, extremely liquid. Marketable securities, it's not quite cash. I can't go to the grocery store 
and say, here's some treasury bonds, will you sell me a Snickers bar? They would say, well, maybe you should sell your treasury bonds and then you can buy the Snickers bar. You say, but, but I don't know, Miss Cashier, I, this treasury bond is very liquid. You'd still say, no, no dice. You have to go sell that treasury bond first. Accounts receivable, well, that's not even money that you have in your hand. At least marketable securities, you've got something. Accounts receivable is a promise from your customers to send you cash. So that's really not liquid. In the inventories is not even accounts receivable yet. That's stuff that you hope to sell. And then when you sell it, you hope to collect. So inventories is even less liquid. And PP&E is, is the least liquid of them all, where it's just property, plant, and equipment that you use to make the inventories, which you use to get the accounts receivable, which you use to get the cash. So hopefully it makes sense that this is an order of liquidity. And then finally, we have things like goodwill and, and intellectual property and intang we call these intangible assets, you know, like a, your brand. And a lot of this is kind of accounting gobbledygook, but obviously an intangible asset will never actually convert itself to cash, right? Your patents won't actually become cash. They're just patents that protect your, your ability to do business, your brand name, your trademarks, all those things. So anyway, th that's sort of what the asset side these are assets. It's the asset side of the balance sheet. Very important. And we can let's that look at like legal rights. rights. Yeah, sure. You know, it can be uh, a lot of it. Quite frankly, turns out it ends up being kind of a accounting stuff um, in terms of goodwill. It's uh, it's as as this uh, Sarah get UB is correctly pointing out here. Goodwill is often it's the entities you've purchased. It's it's a technical accounting rule. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that at some point. Uh, these will be uploaded, this video will be uploaded automatically, so don't worry about that. Um, okay, so let's look at the Apple balance sheet. So we just did our own little, like mini review of a balance sheet. So let's look at Apple's. All right, so current assets. These are uh, assets that are convertible to cash within one year. Everything other than that is gonna take more than a year. So cash and equivalents, 16 billion. Short-term marketable securities, 21 billion. Does anyone not see this? So I'm just gonna add this up. Current cash of Apple is 16, 689 plus 21, 385. That's 38 billion dollars. That's a lot of cash to have burning a hole in your pocket. What's next? How much accounts receivable do they have, guys? 12, 12 billion, 9, 953 million. Yeah, so that's a lot of money that their customers owe them, right? Isn't that kind of crazy? Could you imagine? I get angry when someone owes me 20 bucks, uh, let alone, you know, my customers owe me $12 billion as of December 26th, 2015. Isn't that crazy? And, and the world works that way. It's, that's how Apple does business. That's how every company does business. We're just going to ship. We're going to ship out the, our product and hopefully our customers will pay us. If they don't pay us, of course, we have rights. We could sue them. We won't do business with them together. Et cetera, et cetera. Oh, hey, Phil is here. Phil Kobe, one of our most important men here, uh, most important people, great contributor uh, and friend on Twitter. So, uh, getting back to uh, accounts receivable, um, you know, so that that's how business is done, and it takes some getting used to the idea that you know you're going to do this on faith, and you can see that Apple. Again, $12, $13 billion that it's got out there to its customers. Its customers are probably companies like AT&T and Verizon. They're probably companies like, oh, I don't know, um, uh, retailers that buy their computers and then hope to resell them later, things like that. Okay, so they have $2 billion in, in, in inventories. Obviously, accounts receivable, which I'll just say AR quite a bit here. Uh, AR. Accounts receivable and inventories are not cash. Here's a different receivable. Vendor non-trade receivables. What do you guys think that is? Vendor non-trade receivables. My guess, huh? Well, it's certainly money that's owed to them. Um, it's money that's owed to them. It's not from product they're they're selling. It's from vendors. From vendors. Oh, I think I. Hmm. Yeah, it could be patent rights. Could be patent rights. It's confusing. Who knows? Well, oftentimes you'll see these weird lines, and we'll want to look them up. Uh, we'll want to look them up in the uh, in the financial statements. So we'll see. We'll see what that means shortly. All right. Other current assets. This could be anything. This could be like, for instance, if you pay your rent uh, for January, 
in December, you have to book that as an asset that you've prepaid an expense. If you paid Microsoft for a one-year license ahead of time for some software, for Office software, you actually have to put those uh, in uh, your income, in your balance sheet as an asset. So other current assets, I'll just call it OCA from time to time. And the total current assets, these are all assets that you expect to be cash or converted to cash within one year, 12 months, is $76 billion for Apple. Um, what's next? Long-term marketable securities. So this is super interesting. They have $177 billion of this stuff. I'm, I'm going to add it to the cash balance that I'm keeping tally of here as my top six things that I like to look at when I look at any security. Why do you think I'm doing that, uh, guys who are students? Why do I think that these long-term marketable securities are cash? They're liquid, is the assumption. Yeah, you could sell them. You could, uh, you could trade them for cash pretty easily. Um, their, their value may fluctuate, but you could certainly trade them um, in for cash. Now, why are they long-term securities? Why is there one that's a long-term marketable security, and then there's in the balance sheet, you can see there's one that says short-term marketable security. What's the difference? They're like a deadline by which they can pay. Nope. So these are national, so they're not Apple paying anybody else. Yeah, these, these are yeah these are stocks or bonds that they own. So typically, it's their bonds. Uh, most most corporations don't want to hold stocks right on their balance sheet. You know, they're not hedge funds, uh, including Apple. Um, they like to own bonds. Bonds are safer typically than stocks. And so the reason that the way bonds work is there's a maturity date. Bonds are, are borrowings. So the maturity date is by a certain time frame. Most of the time, big corporations like Apple, they don't even want to own corporate bonds. They want to own government bonds because those are even safer. So what ends up happening is if you have 20, 25 American U.S. Treasury government bonds, what you end up having is that's a long-term security because the government doesn't have to pay you back until 2025. Now you can always sell that bond, uh, so it's still liquid, but it's a long-term marketable security because it won't get paid back for 12 months or more. So it's a little confusing. That's why I just add it all up. I take the cash of 16 billion, the short-term securities of 21 billion, and the long-term securities of 177 billion, I add it all up and I just say, you know what, that's all cash to me. It's about 215 billion worth of cash. And they can separate it and slice and dice it all they want, but at the end of the day, this is uh, basically cashed to me. Okay, so what's next? Property, plant, and equipment, $22 billion. This is literally is stuff that's as complicated as, like I said, semiconductor fabrication equipment, where they create semiconductor wafers, all the way to something as mundane as an office chair. An office chair is gonna last longer than a year, hopefully, if I'm sitting on it. Uh, and uh, it, it'll, you'll have to value that over the course of, of several years. So that's just something to kind of think, think through. Goodwill and intangible assets. These are kind of the accounting gobbledygook that I encourage you to ignore for now. You'll learn more about goodwill and acquired intangible assets later, but there's about 8 billion or 9 billion of that here. And then other non-current assets. Another, you see they have OCA, other current assets, and they have other non-current assets, ONCA. And these are, again, miscellaneous. So it turns out that Apple's balance sheet is a lot like the balance sheet that we kind of looked over and did. And if you want to find a real good gem, you can find that I did the balance sheet of a local drug dealer. Uh, you know, I sometimes teach this class to underprivileged youth, and the only way I can get across to them is, is teaching them uh, with examples that they know of. But... In all seriousness, uh, if you go backwards in time, you might be able to find one of those old lessons. I think people enjoy that <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, I won't do that here since I'm recording this and uh, <laughs> recording this and uh, want people to watch this and take it seriously. All right, so we looked at the assets, and if you total all of them, it's about two hundred ninety-three billion dollars of assets. Two hundred ninety-three billion dollars of assets, and now. Quickly, in, in your mind, you might want to look at the market value of Apple and say it's a $500 billion company and it has $293 billion of assets. How does that make sense? What do you guys think, Marlon? Urkosh? 
does it have to do with uh, what people speculate their value is going to be like at a certain point in time? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, those those uh, are the values today. But uh, clearly, the company will make multiples of, of cash over the next uh, you know several decades. So. Good answer. All right. So, what about liabilities? What about liabilities? Well, liabilities are a little easier than assets. Uh, let's look at a few of these. So, the first liability is accounts payable. Um, the dr most dreaded liability, and I'll just abbreviate A slash P, but it's accounts accounts payable. What's accounts payable? Do you guys know? That's what you have to pay out or what you owe. Yeah, it's uh, it's this, it's the opposite of accounts receivable. Your accounts payable is somebody else's accounts receivable, right? So if if you a good example is is uh, one of the biggest accounts payable for all of corporate America is law firms. So if you go to uh, your favorite law firm, uh, Maduri Thompson LL, LLP. <laughs> you guys just started a law firm. I hope that's okay. And you say, all right, uh, I'm, I, I need your legal services because I need to uh, sell a bunch of uh, Apple computers. And I don't know how to do it. So why don't you guys assist me and advise me on how to sell these Apple computers to AT&T for $25 billion. And, um, and um, that's sort of... Uh, uh, hang on one second. That's kind of the uh, approach. So, so you say, all right, here's the legal services, and then you send a bill, and you invoice Apple, and you say, all right, Apple, you, you owe me $25,000 for those legal advice. And Apple says, okay, we'll pay you within 30 days. Well, that's an accounts payable. When, between day zero and day 30, by the time you write the check, that's an accounts payable. You have to have it on your balance sheet. It's kind of like a debt in that you have to pay it, but it's not really a financial obligation in the sense that you ever borrow the money. It's it's accounts payable for a good or a service. Another example of accounts payable is your rent or, or whatever it might be. All right, what's next? What's another item of liability? Accrued expenses. So the difference between accounts payable and accrued expenses is pretty subtle, uh, and I won't belabor it, but think of, think of accrued expenses as simply expenses that perhaps that you, you are going to have to pay. And again, we'll, we'll talk about accruals and things like that. This is not an accounting class, uh, but we'll definitely have to talk about accruing an expense over time. For example, if you have a contract with uh, somebody, let's say you had a contract with an employee uh, to pay that employee a million dollars, a million dollars a year. Well, your accounts payable is only uh, gonna be uh, every paycheck, individual paycheck for that employee. But your accrued expense could be the whole million dollars. So that's one way to think about an accrued expense. But think of both accounts payable and accrued expenses as basically just cash that you've got, um, uh, funds that you're gonna have to pay for running your, your business. Okay, deferred revenue. This is one of the most complicated, this is one of the most complicated concepts in, in, in accounting and income statements and balance sheets which is um, thankfully not too complicated. Does do any of you guys, other than maybe Quinn, know what deferred revenue is? Isn't it when you, when you earn money before, uh, it's when you receive money before you've earned it? Exactly, it's sometimes called unearned revenue. Um, deferred revenue is literally cash you've gotten, but you haven't given the product out yet. I know some people in this uh, chat would uh, love to be in that situation. Uh, <laughs> most businesses uh, don't operate this way. But sometimes in contracts, you do get cash up front, and you have to then deliver the product. Uh, sometimes you have that when you've got, uh, um, <laughs> there's Akil, another very important uh, moderator here. Um, yeah, sometimes you get cash up front. Gift cards, great example. Um, all kinds of unearned revenue, and that's what deferred revenue is. You get cash, and then you have to deliver the product. And in software, you end up getting a lot of deferred revenue for some reason. We'll talk all about that. So Apple obviously has some software component to their business. So that's deferred revenue. Commercial paper. Commercial paper. That is debt. That's there's Just like there's a bunch of different kinds of cash, there's a bunch of different kinds of debt. Commercial paper is literally loans uh, from banks and things like that. Debt is debt sold to the debt markets. So all of this is money we borrowed, basically. Right, and if you look at uh, hang on one second, if you look at all the debt that Apple's borrowed, I'm going to start with the current. Uh, well, I'm going to start with commercial paper. There's 7.3 billion of that. I'm going to go to Excel and put that in here. 
7259. They've got current portion of long-term debt, 2.5 billion. And then they have long-term debt of $53,204,000,000. So there you have it. Apple has 215 of cash and 62 of debt. So the enterprise value is what? 385 roughly. So the value of Apple, the business, is actually 385 billion, even though the market cap is 530 billion. Why is that? Marlon? You're my best student, man. Don't do this. <laughs> Don't do this to me. Don't what was do it? What was it? <sighs> Repeat it. Repeat the question, is that what you're asking right now? Really? Yeah. All right. Apple's market cap is $538 billion. Apple's enterprise value is $385 billion. Why? I'm going to be in a blank here, man. I'm not going to be able to help you out on this one. Yeah, obviously. No, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the company has uh, $150 billion of net cash. So if the company is worth is trading for $530 billion, but inside that company is $150 billion of cash, when you're paying $580 billion for it, or maybe you're buy, buying a fraction of Apple, which is more likely and reasonable to assume, there, every time you buy a share of Apple, you're literally buying, for every share, you're getting a, uh, a small portion of cash, right? You're buying not only the computer company, but you're also buying um, the cash that the computer company has and the debt they have. And the, if you subtract the cash from the debt, it's about $150 billion. But the market cap is $530 billion. So literally a third of the company, or 30% almost, of the company is just the cash on the balance sheet. So you have to sort of cancel that out. Uh, because if you had a company, let's say, for argument's sake, Apple had $500 billion of cash, what would be wrong with that picture if the stock was trading for a $500 billion market cap? That's like 300, $300 million off. Or billion. Well, the point is that you would have, you could get all of the, it would be too undervalued, right? If the company you could buy, you could buy the whole company or even a part of the company for 500 billion and they already had 500 billion in cash. That would mean that the business you're getting, the business totally for free. I don't know if I you have a better way to explain oh, it. Oh, okay. Right? And right now, the way it works for Apple is the whole business is worth $550 billion, but uh, they have about $150 billion in cash. So it's not quite all for free, but it's a good portion for free. It's kind of a – it's worth noting, right? And you'll see that when we, when we um, value companies based on earnings and things like that, we have to think about the non-cash portion of the business. So we're going to have to look at that carefully. And it, of course, it affects you if you're just buying shares and not the whole company. You very rarely buy a whole company. Um, that's private equity. But it still matters when you uh, are buying shares of a company, even if you're buying a small number of shares of the company. You want to know how much cash the company has. Because think about this. Let's say you did have a company. Let's make, make up a new company. A company that has 50 million market cap and 60 million in cash. What would you guys do? Maduri Thompson Financial. What would you guys do? Uh, definitely buy it. Why? Because it has more cash than its market cap. So yeah. you buy it for fifty million, you get at least sixty million. You make ten million no matter what, basically. It's a basically an arbitrage. Yep, exactly. So Apple's got five hundred billion and one hundred and fifty billion in cash. So it's not free, but it's about a third off if you think of it that way. And we'll, we'll look at this in more and more detail later. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at Apple some more. All right, so the income statement, I'm sorry, the balance sheet uh, has total liabilities of $165 billion. So compared to assets, assets are about $300 billion. Liabilities is about $160 billion. So shareholders' equity is $130 billion. Does anyone know what another name for shareholders' equity is? Public equity? Nope. Book value. Book, book value. So it, it's called book value because it's literally the value of the company in many ways. At assets, if you subtract 
liabilities from assets, or you just say assets minus liabilities, you kind of have the value of the company in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. it sort of makes sense. If you have the assets of the companies and you subtract out the liabilities of the companies, of the company, assets minus liabilities, you have kind of what's left over is shareholder equity, or sometimes we call that book value. Right? Because if you had if you had a company, let's say that was going out of business tomorrow, and you said, all right, how much assets does the company have? Well, it's got, let's say, $500,000 of assets. And it's got $100,000 of liabilities. Well, after you take care of all the liabilities, you, you pay off all the debts that the company owes before it winds down, you'll be left with $400,000, right? That makes sense. Shareholders' equity or book value of $400,000. Now, some of these assets are intangible, right? Like goodwill and patents. The patents aren't going to be worth anything when the company's out of business. So you got to just look at the hard assets or the tangible assets. And you can do something called a tangible book value if you wanted to remove some of those, some of those pesky uh, goodwill and intangible assets. So anyway, that's the basic crux of a balance sheet is the assets minus the liabilities will equal the shareholder's equity. And if you know your algebra, you could add liabilities to both sides. And you can see that assets will always equal liabilities plus shareholders' equity. That's because a balance sheet balances. That's the concept. It has to balance on both sides. And we'll learn more about this if we ever kind of look into accounting. Um, but this is sort of the basic, the basic gist of a balance sheet. And I think we did a good job of looking at it. Now we're going to look at the income statement, um, the second in the, the Holy Trinity. And this is going to be a little bit more fun. Uh, this is going to kind of really make more sense. A uh, balance sheet has a lot to do with accounting, and accounting is a, is a little bit um, dry, <laughs> needless to say, uh, and it's, it's a little more abstract. But when we, deal with, um, when we deal with the income statement, we can really see kind of the reality before our eyes. So let's, let's do the income statement kind of live. Let's do it kind of side by side. I'm doing this obviously on Yahoo. So uh, not on Yahoo, on YouTube. Yahoo. Huh but it's not 1990 anymore. Um, okay, so you can see here the Apple income statement, and you can see that they had $75 billion of revenue in, uh, in Q4 2015. Uh, Q4 is, is the last three months, so it's October, November, December. In just three months, they generated $75 billion of revenue. Now, what is revenue? Let me ask you that. Maduri or Thompson? It's, uh, it's uh, what, what you've earned throughout, throughout the, uh, the period of the quarter. What does that mean? Terrible definition. It's what you've, taken. It's it's what you've taken, taken in. Nope. <laughs> sort of, yes. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but, but can you be more specific? Is it definitely cash I've taken in? Uh, it, it could be anything. It's, it's, or profit, profit would, would be what you've earned. Your, your revenue. It's not really not profit, uh, yeah. Your revenue, revenue includes, includes your expenses. Your expenses. No, or it doesn't, doesn't include your revenue. Your profit, uh, your profit equals your revenue minus your expenses. Yeah, I'm just asking you about revenue. Yeah, yeah. your revenue, revenue uh, is, is the opposite, opposite of that. Revenue is just sales. Revenue, sales, turnover, receipts—they're all—they all mean the same thing. We'll worry about costs and profits in a second. But when it comes to revenue. How do you know something is revenue? Obviously, if, if it's a retailer, right? When you sell the sweater and you get cash for the sweater, you understand that's revenue for sure. But can revenue be more complicated than that? Sure, right? I mean, what if, what if your law firm, right? You said you, you gave us an invoice for $50,000 and I said, wait a second, I only used $40,000 of resources. How much revenue should you book? And what if I told you I'm not going to pay you for 60 days? Is it revenue still? All of these questions are, are, are actually pretty important. And, and recognizing revenue is actually pretty difficult. And we call it revenue recognition. And sometimes, if you're really fancy in business, we call it RevRec. RevRec. And obviously, RevRec is simple in some businesses and not so simple in other businesses. And in general, the kind of idea for re when you recognize revenue, when do you recognize revenue? Typically, it's when, and this is a general rule, it doesn't always apply, but in general, it's when what? You guys know? Quinn, maybe? 
It's when title, title to the product has passed to the customer. So someone else owns the asset, whatever it is. Yes, exactly. So even if it's on a promise, so a lot of revenue you don't actually have to have received the cash, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually, you know, a promise is good enough, if that makes sense. So you can book revenue on just a promise. There's a lot of other rules. Like you obviously can't sell your product to another part of your own business, right? You have to net that out. That's called intercompany revenue. And it happens sometimes and there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to take it out. Intercompany revenue gets canceled. It's, and, and a lot of accounting fraud, I think uh, a bunch of internet companies have this as a fraud, Enron had this as a fraud, is when you, if you're selling to your own company, you can often uh, overinflate your revenue. Uh, then there's things like, what if you have a contract over four years? How do you, and, and someone gives you all of the cash up front. Let, let, let's, let's use that example. Let's say you have a $10 million contract with Boost Mobile. Boost Mobile, your young GZ. This is Young GZ Incorporated. Young GZ Inc. And you have a $10 million contract with Boost Mobile to promote Boost Mobile products for four years. And it comes time for, for Q1 2016, Q1 2016 revenue. How much do you report? And Boost Mobile gives you a check for $10 million. How much do you report? Do you report 10 million? Do you report 2.5 million? Or do you report 750,000? I mean, there's no way to, to really, really tell. tell. No, there is. It's, it's, there's specific rules. And it's called FASB. And you report $750,000. FASB is Financial Accounting Standards Board. And again, accountants need to know this, but if you're going to be an investor, you need to know some of this stuff too. It's, accounting is a language of business. And you have to know the language of business. And t- $10 million is the cash you get. Sure, you get all the cash, but your revenue is only $750,000. And you'll report that every quarter for the next four years, for 16 quarters. Uh, your balance sheet will have the $10 million on it right away. But then that's when you have deferred revenue. So what you'd end up having is you'd have revenue of $750,000 every quarter. And on the balance sheet, this is the income statement, on the balance sheet, you would have deferred revenue of, of $9,250,000 because you still have to, col- you, you've collected the $10 million, your cash will be $10 million. But you haven't performed $9.25 million of services because you can bet that if young Jeezy stops rapping about Boost Mobile one quarter into his four quarter deal, Boost Mobile will sue him. So he's got to carry that deferred revenue and write it off every quarter for the next, for the next uh, 16 quarters or 15 quarters. So anyway, that's how sort of revenue recognition can be pretty tricky. Obviously, you know, if, if, if uh, Apple sells $10, million, $10 billion of iPhones to AT&T, it's relatively simple, but believe it or not, it can still be complicated. For instance, returns. What about returns? Return policy is a huge part of revenue recognition. Um, oftentimes, companies like Apple will have a return policy. So they'll say, you know what, ATT, if you return us any of your phones, we'll give you your money back for the phones uh, that you return. And some companies have no return policy. Um, you know, it really depends on your company. But a return policy is somewhat common, and you have to reserve revenue for return policies and all kinds of things like that. So anyway, there's a lot of complexity to, to revenue recognition. It may seem really simple, but sales are not as simple. All right. So next we have something called COGS or cost of goods sold. What's a cost of goods? Thanks All right. a lot. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully someone can bring in uh, thanks, Gun. Someone can bring in another financial expert up in here. <clears throat> so COGS, C O G S, cost of good sold. Cost of goods that'd sold. Be the, Go ahead, Marlon. That'd be the value of the, the goods sold. Nope. Period. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Cost of goods sold is the cost to make the revenue. So it's literally cost of revenue. So if they sold $75 billion, right, of phones and 
iTunes and all these things. It costs them $45 billion to make that stuff. So they have a margin left over, and that's called the gross margin. Gross margin. And you can see, I'm not going to type in, if you, if you look at this closely, I'm not going to type in uh, 30, 4, 2, 3. I'm actually just going to subtract cell F3 and cell F4. So subtract cell F4 from F3, and I get 30,423,000, because that is the gross margin. So they sold $76 billion of products in Q4. That means they might have gotten cash for some of that. They might have not gotten cash for some of that. But they, they pushed out $75 billion of their products to the world, whether or not they got paid right away or didn't get paid right away. And it cost them $45 billion to make that stuff. So it cost them money to buy the glass and the equipment, all the stuff that goes into one of these things. Um, and you can see that they made, if you think about it, they made about half. They made about 50%. For every dollar they sold, it cost them about 50 cents to, uh, to produce those goods. So if we actually just do this, we can do gross profit or gross margin percentage. We'll call this gross profit. And we can, we can do the formula. Does anyone know what the formula is? Uh, it's your total sales, uh, the revenue minus your cogs. No, so that's what gross profit is. As a percentage, gross profit divided by revenue is 40%. And we got a great question from Dan Van Glan. Does it include labor? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. According to GAAP, generally extended, accepted accounting principles, which are promulgated by FASB, the Financial Accounting uh, and Standards Board, uh, any cost of the product, whether it's... Um, uh, um, the, the, the raw materials, even the plant, operating the plant, the person that works at the plant that maybe um, is the plant manager but doesn't actually make any of the goods, that's still a cost of goods sold, uh, usually. So what, where, where the costs go into what bucket is sometimes unclear. Obviously, uh, the cost of all the equipment and things like that will go into the COGS. And we're going to worry about depreciation and things like that later those will be very complicated. So what we end up with is they sold $75 billion of goods, and we're gonna keep chipping away at that until we get a profit line at the end. And the first thing we're gonna chip away is the, costs that, the cost of making the products themselves. So after we got 75 billion in the door, is one way to think about it, we're down to $30 billion of profit left over. So what's the next expense? This is accounting, this is an income statement. This is the income statement. So we're trying to figure out what our income is at the end of the day. But there's more expenses than just the products themselves. So what they cost, there's research and development. Apple has a bunch of smart guys sitting around and thinking about how to make new products. They only spent $2 billion on that stuff. Isn't that interesting? Think about how much profit they have, $30 billion, right? And they spent only $2 billion, $2 billion on research. And how about marketing? Selling general administrative. So that's not just marketing. That's the CEO's salary, Tim Cook. That's their office building. That's all kinds of uh, other things. That's their legal expenses. That's only about $4 billion. So they were a really profitable company. After their cost to make the stuff, they barely spend any money on these other things. So we're going to call these operating expenses. Operating expenses. These are the, this is what it costs to run Apple, about $6 billion. $45 billion to actually make the products, but $6 billion to actually run the company. So operating profit is kind of what's left over. And this is an important line. Operating profit is kind of gross profit minus operating expenses. So now we're down to $24 billion. So revenue was $75 billion in Q4, 15. And now operating profit is $24 billion. So we can actually do an operating margin. Operating margin. And that operating margin is roughly 32%. That's a very high margin. Most businesses don't have a 32% operating margin. Uh, some pharmaceutical companies do, uh, but retailers and, and things like that have more like 10% operating margins. So pretty pretty healthy margins from Apple. Uh, what's left after, after operating profit? What other expenses could there be? It's going to be a lot of financial and taxation kind of expenses. So that's the only thing separating us between operating profit and what we call net profit. Net profit. 
So taxes is a huge part of that. Uh, and interest, interest on all that cash they've got, right? They, 400, they get $402 million of just interest. So we call that pre-tax income. And then there's finally taxes, which are what, they, what you think they might be. And again, taxes aren't necessarily cash they've spent. That's just cash that they're going to spend often. And what we're left with is $18 billion. So we can calculate again a net margin percentage. $18 billion left over after $75 billion of revenue. So 24 cents. Every, every dollar that Apple gets from you, they keep 24 cents. Isn't that interesting? We can also calculate a tax rate. What does Apple pay in taxes? Well, they, they're making 24 billion before taxes. They, they spent 6 billion on taxes. So 6 divided by 24 is 25%. How about that? Apple pays double or triple the tax, or we, we all pay double or triple the tax that Apple pays, even though Apple is a, a corporation. So that's what a lot of people don't like about corporate America. 25% tax rate, that's pretty low. And then we can think about it on a per share basis. So we, what's the income per share or earnings per share, EPS? Well, we have to write down how many shares there are. Let's do this. There are 5,594,127 shares. So let's see. So the earnings per share is $3.28. OK, so that's sort of Apple's income statement for Q4. Any questions? I'll teach you some quick Excel tricks that we can do. Keep in mind, the income statement is giving us, um, and if you see any questions from, from people in the chat, you know, feel free to just repeat them if you don't have your own question. But in Q4, you can see they, did, they, gave, you, they gave you this year's quarter and then last year's quarter. So what we can do is we can actually take all of this, copy it, and paste it, and the formulas all come over. So what we can do is we can just quickly type in all the numbers from last year, and the formulas are all there. So everything automatically updates. So it's super fast to just quickly update all of it, because it's all the same format. Now we can see that the final number is the same, 18024, 18024. And we can copy and paste all of these. Hmm. So it's pretty easy. And now we can even compare revenue increases year over year. And this is a big problem for Apple. If you look at Q4 of 2015 divided by Q4 of 2014, revenue only increased by 2%. And the way you can figure that out is the simple quotient of new divided by old. New divided by old minus 1 expressed as a percentage will give you a change from new uh, in, in new from old. So you can see Apple's revenue isn't growing anymore. And I wonder why that is. It could be because they haven't released a new product. It could be because they're just slowing down in general. Who knows? But it's definitely a worrisome trend. And we'd have to ask Apple why that's happening. Maybe people are already talking about it. That's how an income statement looks for Apple. We can also uh, we can also type in the balance sheet very quickly if we wanted. So we're going to have to pay attention to that as well. So we did cash. So just do this super fast one more time. And I'm happy to take questions as they come up. So I guess like if you're looking at companies that you might be interested in investing in, are you trying to look at the... Um, the growth in their revenue uh, quarter by quarter. Sure, but you know we haven't yet, you know, come even close to making any decisions on anything. You know that that we probably won't even touch that until lesson four, five, six, seven. You know, it takes a okay. long time. We're just trying to understand how to even read these things, you know, and what, how to sort of order them and format them into a way that we can use 
right? Uh, we can use to make decisions later. You know, we're not even close. We're not even close to uh, to being being able to use this information in a way that's useful yet. You know, but it's good for beginners, especially, to say, all right, this is this is the way Apple works. You know, it's 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 very important to know kind of what uh, you know what exactly. Is this company's profile? What's their margin profile, for instance? Do they are they the kind of company that loses money? Are they the kind of company that makes money? Are they the kind of company that makes a lot of money? What's the relative amounts? Especially as we compare them to other companies like IBM or Hewlett Packard or other computer makers, um, you know, phone makers like Samsung. Um, we want to be able to compare them and say, why does Apple do so much better than these companies or, or whatever? So anyway, right now we're not totally concerned yet with kind of what, uh, um, you know, thinking about what to look at yet. Um, we'll, we'll sort of, we'll get to that maybe even tonight in terms of what are companies worth, what are assets worth, and, and that's, you know, a, a much, turns out to be a much more difficult question than just kind of what is this company doing? What are they actually doing every day? So... So that's sort of a preview of the balance sheet, and and, and believe it or not, in my uh, in my PowerPoint, that's ex that's exactly the next question: is what is the value of a company? And uh, we we got a nice taste of what an income statement and a balance sheet look like from Apple. We're going to totally throw all this away and uh, start again, and we're going to start with a brand new topic of what does. Um, you know, and that'll, we actually did it right on the hour. I don't know if anyone has any questions about Apple. At 9 o'clock, we'll start sort of this very important question of how do we value things? Not just Apple stock, but anything. How do we value stuff? How do we, how do we value uh, cash flow? So any questions on Apple real quick? A counter asset? I don't know what that is. UK exit, that has nothing to do. Contra asset, yeah, we don't have to worry about accounting just quite yet. Uh, Martin, so you were talking about the GAAP or GAAP. Is that where you can find all of like the because there are like a lot of different terms on these, uh, like uh, the fi the financial statements that I don't really know too much about. Is there any good resource for like just reviewing those terms? Or I think just like practice makes perfect. You know, they're they're all like self evidentary. Um, you know, like vendor receivables, receivables from vendors, right? It's money your vendors owe you. I don't know why your vendor would owe you money. Usually, you owe your vendor money, not the other way around. Investopedia, I guess, you know, but I just think, you know, reading dozens and dozens of these, you will, you will get there. You know, it's, uh, okay. it's, it's not that you don't need, uh, too much, uh, too much, uh, information about this stuff. Hmm. Yeah, it was definitely helpful. So far. A good question here. Do companies report revenues from their individual products on their SEC statements? Sometimes. You have to go through those statements. I think I was banned from Wall Street Bets, so I can't uh -huh. can't visit it. Reddit, I don't. I barely use Reddit. And try, and try to stay on topic, because otherwise, uh, everyone will uh, you confuse and you lower the quality of this to everyone. Companies are not obligated to pay dividends to their shareholders, typically. Okay, so... <sighs> okay, so let's talk about... Um, is the SEC site accurate? Yes, companies have to, under penalty of, of, of arrest, 
uh, they can be accused of fraud. SEC statements have to be accurate. And there's actually a bunch of people sitting in prison cells right now over misstatements in in accounting. Uh, uh, Enron is a good example. Uh, WorldCom, uh, Computer Associates, etc. So they definitely Tyco is another good one. So they definitely have to uh, have to do that correctly. Okay. Oh, hey, there's uh, our buddy Charlie. You're it's perfect. Good to have to back up. Okay, great. Charlie's just in time. Nine o'clock oh. here. Hey. What's going on? You're just in time. We're about to go into. Uh, as soon as I logged on, I heard SEC investigation. investigation. I was immediately intrigued. I thought you might be talking about that. Right. No, I didn't. I think we said just SEC filings, but. Uh, gotcha. What's up? Uh, not much. We're just getting to. Uh, we just finished looking at Apple's income statement and balance sheet. Now we're going to talk about something probably a lot more important, which is how do we value cash flow, and um, and what is cash flow, and what is I like discounting it. cash flow, and all this stuff. And this is a uh, this is a pretty complicated field, and and I can probably teach you the definitions in thirty seconds, but the the point of this is to understand it like the back of your hand, not to be able to recite a definition. So is anyone I, before? I, are you looking at some slides right now? Right now? Yeah, there's a there's a website. Um, I'll give you the link. You made me post this real quick. Uh, it's a YouTube. It's my YouTube live stream link. Um, Got it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just need one more person to join. I know there's a bunch of people. Watching. Going? Hi. Are you a finance student or finance expert? Bullish. Okay. Hello, bullish. Thanks for joining, dude. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. All right, you got the slides up. Okay, good. Yo. Hi, you kind of look like, kind of look like a bum. And your, <laughs> your, your background's echoing a little too much. So we're just, uh, we're just gonna do this with us three. Yesterday, yesterday. Total stage, stage fright. fright. Did, Did not, not realize there were that many viewers. No, that's right. All right, so let's talk about cash and, and what it's worth. And this is, again, the, this is the core of finance. Uh, this is going to be, I want everyone to pay close attention. What we did with Apple, it's more technical, you know, more kind of uh, detailed. This is much more theoretical. And this is going to be a lot of fun if I do this right. And it's going to confuse you and give you much pain if I do it wrong. So this is going to be really important. We'll just lock the, the room so we don't get any distractions. Okay, so what's a dollar worth? Uh, I ask this question a lot, and like every interview uh, for financial people, I ask this question like 20 different ways. And uh, one of my favorite questions is my first, one of my first interview questions is, I say, if I give you a dollar, one dollar, every year, every January 1st, forever. And it's actually a contract. It literally is a contract that I'm going to sign right here, Martin Shkreli. And you can, uh, it's dated today, dated today. And it says in the fine print, it says section two, section two. So this is section one. Every January 1st forever, I give you one dollar. Section two says, you can sell and transfer this contract. Okay, so I give this contract to, to you, Mr. Maduri. Okay. Congrat congratulations, you've gotten this contract for absolutely nothing. And you want to yes. sell it, you want to sell it to Charlie. How much does he pay? Um, so I guess however many years forever is, I try to charge more than that. I need a number, Mr. Maduri. Um, I'm going to say $1,000. Get out of my office. <laughs> You're fired. You're done. You're not getting the job. Somebody else is. And I'm going to kick your ass on the way out, and my goons are going to take whatever money's in your wallet. You're done. 
<laughs> Sorry, you lose. Anyone think they can come in here and explain it? I'll actually give you. Uh, I will give you this contract if you can come in here and explain it correctly. Can you, can you give, give a, a brief synopsis, synopsis of, the of the contract really quick? quick? It's a. It's a simple. It's one dollar. I just did. Are you watching my YouTube stream? Here, I am. I'm looking for the, 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 the slide you guys are on. No, no, it's on the. You're watching the wrong thing, probably. It's right on my. It's right on my page. Sorry, can you repeat it? No, you're missing out on your ability to make money. Oh, what if I um, sell it for? Hang on, hang on. No, you're you're done, dude. You're done. We kicked you out of the. We kicked oh. you out. You're on the. You're on the street right now, nursing your wounds. From my biggest, my biggest goons. <laughs> Fool. Who, who can actually come in here and explain it? That guy seems to, some of you guys in typing seem to be able to explain it. Uh, how, how long, long, is, is, how long do you receive a dollar? It's perpetuity. I know, so that you, much, I know that you know the answer, Charlie. This is How much would I pay for a contract that pays me a dollar every year for every I, I know that you know the answer. Let's not spoil it. Let's see if someone can come in here and explain it. It's a $1 contract. I'll give you a dollar every January 1st forever, as long as this piece of paper exists. And forget about like me. Pretend I live forever in this scenario. Pretend I'm going to live forever. I'm going to always have that ability to pay you a dollar as well. There's no solvency risk. There's no end of life risk. It's just a dollar forever. And you can sell the contract to get a dollar forever to whoever you want. This is, this turns out that this, closer. this is actually a very, very tough question to answer. And you'd be surprised. I've interviewed probably a thousand people in the last few years. You'd be shocked at the freaking answers I've gotten for this question. A thousand, a thousand is heard a thousand. We heard a thousand from Mr. Maduri. Let's see what other people have to say. Come on in. I'd, I'd like to see rapid fire, kind of who. And I'm just going to exit out real quick, Maduri. See if we can get, see if we can get people to come in here and explain your answer. You have like 10, 20 seconds tops to sort of explain it. And the winner gets a hundred bucks by PayPal. Ooh, things just got real. Chris, everyone's saying repeat the question. <laughs> you shouldn't be paying attention. Chris, your mic isn't isn't working. It seems like. So you you you're like the guy who shows up to the interview late. You're done. You have your mic. That's all for sixty k too, bass. Sixty <laughs> k is that? Legit answer. Yeah. Use the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> Winner circle, you got this. J Rock. I wouldn't sell it. That's my answer. Winner circle. That's your answer. Why would Why would you sell something that's guaranteed that's that style? All right. You also don't get the job. Uh, J Rock. He's thinking outside the box. No, I'm, I'm getting. I'm, I'm putting his answer down as question mark, question mark, question mark. Too confused. <laughs> J Rock, your mic doesn't work again. You're the guy who shows up to the interview drunk. Don't do that. Oh, Billy the fridge. Billy the fridge. Okay. Um, Twenty I seconds. Say, I was gonna say, depending how long you're gonna live, say. I'm 20 years old right now. I'm going to live to be 87. I told you it doesn't. Age doesn't matter. Just pretend it. Like my and my my nephews will have to take over. My son. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. All right. No explanation given, but eight dollars is the is the answer you gave. It's not a great answer. How about you, Para? It's amazing. The average American does not understand finance. Give us a hint. Of course, blab doesn't work.
Thank you, Sandra. I think we're back. Okay, Sandra, you have an answer? Yeah, um, sorry, I like that for a bit. But my answer is that uh, present value of a dollar is, if you had a dollar now versus a dollar next year, you could use it in out in the market and you can make your interest on it or make an investment. So yeah. you kind of pick a common, um, or what looks to be a trending interest rate, you use the present value table. Um, when you, once you get into perpetuity of the present value of dollar, it stops really mattering how many years. So when you recommend ages, that's why it kind of doesn't really matter. So you'd rather have a dollar now versus later, so you'd rather sell it I'd say around $13.5. 13 and a half. Wow. Bam! What an answer. What a babe. What a goddess. What a genius. Congratulations. You are insanely smarter than everyone. Charlie, do you accept? You're buying it for thirteen fifty. What are you doing? I accept it. I accept it. Alright, you're done. Thirteen fifty. Trade's done. Congratulations. Thank you. Of course, it's probably worth about fifty bucks in my opinion. I was going to say, like, I guess, like, the actual value depends on who's buying it. Yeah, it's a tricky question. All right, so we got one we got one smart person up in here. Hey, that was a great question, Martin. I love it. I, I've, got, I've got 100 variations of this that I ask finance people who want to work for me, who want to invest my money or help me invest, and um, it's pretty complicated. Uh, well, it's all about, and I will explain why $50. I will... I will explain in tremendous detail. We'll spend the next, if I, if I do my job right here, I'll excite you so much about this that we'll, you'll spend the rest of your life trying to think about what cash flow is worth. Uh, your cash flow, a business's cash flow, a septic tank pumping company's cash flow, an electricity company's cash flow, a drug company's cash flow, any, anything. Um, and so this is just one small example of how do we value future cash flow? So we know how to value today's cash flow. If, if I said I'm going to give you five dollars in five minutes, and I say, well, what would you sell that? What would you sell that contract for? Well, it's going to be about five dollars. I mean, depending on the uncertainty, it could be four dollars and ninety nine 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 cents. There's actually people that do this. It's called overnight repos. If you want to look into that, there's actually a market for this kind of paper. It's actually re repurchases as repos. And there's actually a marketplace for that kind of that kind of transaction, where it's literally the interest of a dollar, uh, the interest of, of something literally from the night to the morning as a, as a repo. And there's things like called carry trades, where you're carrying a trade for just an, just a short period of time, and you're earning an infinitesimally small amount of interest. Obviously, it's easy to determine the the, the discounted value of something in, in a short period of time. But what if I told you I was going to give you a thousand dollars? in 10 years or I can give you $100 a year for uh, nine years. Which one's better? Uh, so I'd prefer to start receiving the money now. Well, you know, this isn't, uh, as, you can, as you can imagine, this isn't a guessing game. This is not, this is something we can actually calculate to extreme precision. To extreme precision. Okay. Uh, with so like, are you going to use like a seven percent return on the hundred dollars? We could use any return we want, and that's the great thing about it. Is it's it's uh, we could we could say, well, what if we don't make a return? What if we do make money with the hundred dollars a year? What if we, et cetera, et cetera? What if there's inflation? What if there's deflation? All these things we can actually get an exact answer, and that's what finance is all about. This is literally the the discipline known as finance. Let's, let's get down to it. Yeah. Let's, let's explain this $1,000 or $100 cool. a year. Okay. So the concept that uh, our guest, um, who was quite good and quite eloquent, eloquent, pointed out is that $1 today is worth more than, usually worth more than $1 tomorrow. Not just usually, almost always. Hell has to freeze over for one dollar to be worth less today than tomorrow. Why? Why? And the answer to the to the thousand dollar question and the answer to the one dollar question all lies in this concept. It all lies in this kind of concept. Why? 
One, someone said inflation. Okay, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. We could talk more about inflation. The better answer is Akil's. It's opportunity cost. Oppor or just, or just say opportunity or investment potential. Same way molecules have potential energy. If you had a dollar today, let's say that's, let's say it's Monday. Uh, let's say it's Monday, January 1st, 2016, and you had a thousand dollars versus Monday, January 1st, 2019, and you have a thousand dollars. Which which is the better place to be if you're an investor? Well, you'd much rather be in 2016 because you can invest that thousand dollars. Let's say you make a 10% return per year. Well, in 2017, you would have one thousand. $100. In 2018, how much would you have? $1,210, right? And in 2019, how much would you have? Gosh, my math is starting. Yeah, something like that. I think that's right. Um, so, um, you would actually have $1,331 in 2019 versus $1,000 in 2019. So the ability to invest the money and earn a return is why a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. But how much more? And, and why, is, why would we pick 10% here? Why not 20% or 3% or 1%? I mean, I mean, it, it depends, depends on the kind of return you get. And what about negative percentages? There's so such there's a such thing as possibility. There's a such thing as deflation, right? So we have to think about all of those things. And and this is what finance is all about. We toss and turn about this. We toss and turn about all this stuff. What about risk? What a fantastic point. Danny Argueta, you are a special person. That is the most important thing, in fact, is risk. And we'll talk about that soon. Risk. So we got inflation, opportunity, which is risk. It's not a third thing. Opportunity and risk are the same thing. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute as well. So this is really a theoretical it's kind of a very theoretical part of finance, and I love it because it very, it's almost philosophical even. It's almost philosophical. And what's so philosophical and theoretical about it? Well, we know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, but Apple, Apple has that exact issue. In fact, every stock we're ever going to look at, the concept is a dollar today and a dollar tomorrow are something to think about. So if Apple makes $18 billion a quarter, that means they make what? $70 billion a year, and if they make $70 billion a year, we can actually discount that and add it up. And we'll talk about that in a second. But keep the Apple example in mind. All right, so now we have the question of how much is a dollar, how much less or more is a dollar worth today than tomorrow? Okay. So like I said, if I told you I was going to give you $5 today, or this year, and I was going to give you five dollars next year, and and every year there, thereafter. We obviously, if we summed all these things up, I don't know if you guys know this. Sigma means sum, capital sigma in, in Greek. If we summed all of these, all of these from from beginning of 2016 to infinity, what would the answer be? It would be an infinity. Yeah, it would actually be infinity because we'd have an infinite number of years. And obviously, the right to buy, the right to get $5 a year forever is not worth infinity. It is not worth infinity. It is worth less than infinity, for sure. So why? Why? Well, let's go year by year. So if I told you I was going to give you $5 right now, you'd say, oh, yeah, that sounds like it's worth $5. I trust you, Martin. I think you have $5. What about $5 next year? Well, who knows about next year? You know, I don't, you may not know. You may not be able to collect next year. God only knows. And then again, the idea that 
$5 will be worth $5 next year, it won't be. We know at least there might be some inflation. We know that I'd rather have the $5 today than a year from now because I can invest. Uh, I can invest that $5 and maybe make a few percentage return. So $5 is pro in 2017 is probably worth less than $5 in 2016. It's probably worth less than $5 in 2018. It's worth even less than that of 2017. So let's say it was worth, let's just say 3% less. What would that annuity be worth? So let's 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 do this out in Excel. And Excel is great because you can you can just simply do it the way uh, you see me doing it here. So five dollars, and we're going to take uh, five dollars times 0 .97, 0 0.97, which is three percent less than before. And we're going to copy and paste all the way down. And you can see that as we get less and less, we approach a value of what? Each year, the value of that $5 approaches zero. It's like an asymptote in, in, in calculus, right? And in fact, we can kind of graph, we can even graph what the, the, the $5 per annum. Remember, the face value is $5 every year. It's always going to be $5. In, 22, uh, in year 2250, you will get $5. But the, the value but that $5, $5 is, is going to be shit. Yeah, exactly. In, in, 20, in the year 2300, it's not going to be worth much. And so we can actually we can actually graph this and sort of see what it looks like. It'll be fun to see that. How do we do that? Let's see. Insert line graph. Here we go. Yeah, here. You can see the value of $5. It, it sort of reaches this asymptote of zero. In math, an asymptote is a line that approaches another number, another line, but never quite touches it. And you can see that by the time it's like 50 years out, it really isn't, you know, the, the $5 really isn't worth very much. Or maybe a dollar. So if we take the sum of this, the equal sum, and we sum all of these numbers, we get $166. $5 a year forever is about $166 today. Even though if we sum all the, the cash we're going to get, it was $1,660. This is, let's see how many years this was for. How many years was this contract for? 332 years. It was a 332-year bond where I get $5 every year. I'm going to collect, by the end of the bond, I'm going to collect six, $1,660. But today, the bond would trade for $166. Why? We got to think about this. We got to think about it carefully. What if we we're only discount by, by, and let's let's add more years to this. Let's let's go let's go into thousands of years. See what happens if we do that. Hang on. So we're going to call the rate at which we discount the cash flow from one year to the next the discount rate. And we're going to change this formula. And I encourage you all to make this Excel sheet yourself. We're going to change this formula to the discount rate. We're going to see what happens when we change the discount rate to 10%. What do you think the value of the bond will, will do? Obviously, the amount we're going to collect will be the same. This, this contract promises, promises us $9,310. $5 a year for, for a long time. Let's see how many years we, we put in this. If we increase the discount rate, what's the value of this contract? It's going to be lower. Yeah, it's going to be lower. Why? Because it approaches zero at an early rate, it gets closer to zero at a much earlier time. Yeah, so we can see that it goes down to $50. If it's 5%, it's $100. If it's, if it's 3%, it's $166. If it's 
it's $250. You can see that they're inversely proportional. In fact, as it, a fascinating thing is as the discount rate approaches zero, the value of the bond approaches what? $9,310. No, it approaches infinity. Oh, okay. I guess I was assuming for the amount of time that we were collecting. Why, why do you think it approaches infinity? Oh, yeah, I guess yes. Yeah, correct. It does if you, have a, if you have an end to it. But we could always extend this even further, right? If it's an annuity, an annuity is, is infinite. Well, the answer is if, if a dollar today was not worth the same as a dollar tomorrow, then it would be it would be a uh, it would be worth something uh, vastly more. But we assume that that money is worth less over time because of things like risk and opportunity cost. So we have to think very carefully about how to discount a series of cash flow. And in businesses and bonds and stocks, we have these yearly cash flows we come to expect. In this case, this is very boring. We expect $5 every year, forever. Businesses obviously aren't like this. The cash flow we get fluctuates. We hope it grows, right? We hope that the, the CEO of the company figures out a way to make this go from five to six, from six to seven, from seven to eight, hopefully from eight to 800. You know, uh, if you're a CEO like me, you want as much profit as possible. And, and you, you have to discount you have to discount that cash flow because something might go wrong in the year 2029. You can't predict what the earnings of your business will be in 2029. Can you imagine the people who are forecasting Motorola? Motorola's earnings 10 years ago. Motorola and Nokia were on the top of the world 10, 20 years ago, right? right. Motorola. So this is one that is like, how do you put a number on what you should discount? It's, that is the secret of finance. That's the, you're literally, you know, touching on the number one question in finance, which is, is it subjective? a little bit. What is the discount rate? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look. What is the, the interest rate of a government bond? Does anyone know what the 10 year bonds yield? Not much. Bonds. I mean, like. One percent. Yeah, it's about two percent. One point seven percent. One point five percent. Something like that. One point seven four. This guy may be a bond trader. So apparently, the government says it's not less than inflation. It's not less than inflation. So the U.S. government bond is theoretically risk-free. Right? It's theoretically risk-free. There's no risk that Obama and Trump, our future president, uh, will not pay the, uh, the uh, obligations, right? What if the government fails? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, there's no risk that the government won't pay its debts. And we'll talk about how realistic that is in a second. I mean, theoretically, there's, there's some risk, right? And we could actually measure that risk with a Bloomberg machine, believe it or not, on something called a strip or a tips security. But regardless of a tips, a tips security, um, we can see that the, the government bonds have an interest rate of about 1.74%. So the government can borrow money from us for 1.74%. That means that we get this interest rate. And in fact, the risk of not getting paid is worth 1.7.4% to us. And that's simple. If I lent Charlie $5,000, I would ask him for 10% interest. Because, you know, I don't know Charlie. He seems like a nice guy and he seems very smart. So the fact that I'm willing to lend him any money at all is, is already telling. I'll take a 10% rate for, yeah, what it's worth. And, uh, and I, I just size him up and I say, you know what? There's a good chance he's not going to give me back the 5,000 bucks. Um, who knows? He will, uh, who knows? Yeah, reasonably good chance he will. So I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him a, a 10% interest rate. Now, if a friend of mine named Maurice, who has a uh, arrest record and uh, he's known to traffic uh, narcotics in my community, Maurice wanted to 
uh, borrow $5,000 from me, I don't know, what interest rate should I charge him? I think Maurice is more likely, more likely to default. More likely to default. I'd be taking my quarterly payments of half an inch. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna you know charge him a higher interest rate because I just don't think Maurice is gonna pay me. In fact, there's probably no interest rate that I would I would I would take. <laughs> it's not a black or white thing. There's a you know let's make give him an Albanian name. Uh, uh, what's a good Albanian name? Let's just make him an American name, Bob. Bob, yeah, Bob the crackhead. <laughs> Bob the crackhead. Mark it up five thousand percent. So, so it's a very difficult loan, and and I'm worried about that. But the government, how about Apple? How about Apple? I can blend the company's money. It doesn't have to be people. Going for cheap. Here's another good one. Brazil. This guy's making a good point. Brazil is six percent interest rate right now. The U.S. government is two percent. So we can see what the least risky, the least risky securities are. We can make a list. In fact. U.S. 1.74 percent, Brazil 6 percent, Apple I think is borrowing money at 2 percent. I can look that up with uh, Bloomberg, uh, which I'll log into in a minute. Ah, uh, the Bloomberg. Charlie, my loan to Charlie is 10 percent. My loan to Bob is 50 percent. So you can see that the riskier the riskier a loan is, or a cash flow is, the less we expect to get paid. The less we can discount it. The riskier a loan is, the more we have to discount it. Does that make sense? Good. It does. So if we have a corporation, remember, these are bonds. These are secured obligations. Bonds are senior to equity. Cash flow from equity is riskier. So when Apple makes $18 million this year, this is Apple's income statement, we don't know what they're gonna make in 2017. It could be 10% more, it could be 10% less. We don't know. We have no idea. Let's look at an athlete. Let's take a, who's, name, name an athlete everyone likes. LeBron James, Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Eric. Can I do an example? So what is the value of Steph Curry's contract? He's gonna make, let's say he's gonna make 10 million a year for five years. I don't even know what team he plays for, Golden State Warriors, I think? Yeah. So let's say he's gonna make 10 million a year for five years. What's the value of his contract? It's $50 million. Million. On paper, it's, you're going to get $50 million in payments. But what about present value? Well, it's a guaranteed contract from a major company. So it's probably not very risky. But even the least risky thing, even the least risky thing, a government bond, a promise from the U.S. government, it has never broken its promise in 200, how old is this country? 250 years. It has never broken its promise. Is not about to break it soon. That's the most ironclad, iron, at least at least for bonds, it's never broken its promise. <laughs> Wars and shit like that breaks it every day. But for bonds, it's never uh, broken its promise. Apple, very credit worthy. Brazil, Charlie, Bob. <laughs> these, are, these are much riskier. So, but Steph Curry is a Golden State Warriors. Uh, you gotta, yeah, you gotta discount that, discount. No, yeah. he's gonna get his money. And remember, his contract says, "Pay if you're discounting even you're if that, injured." You gotta discount Steph Curry. I would say a discount rate of five percent would be appropriate. Okay. So in Excel, what we do here is we actually do something like this. It goes equals NPV parentheses five percent, comma, and then we highlight all of these. And we get a number, it's $43,290,000. That is the present value. And why is it 43 million and not 50 million? Can anyone 
Answer that. It's because there's some risk uh, if the NBA defaults. There's some risk in the NBA defaults. So that's a good point. <laughs> the more likely, not likely. <laughs> the more likely scenario is the op is that there's opportunity cost. And it's not like he's not going to collect. He's going to collect $50 million. There's no doubt. The point is, he would rather trade five equal installments of $10 million for $44 million or $45 million. And the discount rate, this is a really important concept right here. You guys, this is gold here, what I'm about to tell you. It's a secret. The discount rate... should be equal to the risk-free rate, which is usually just projected inflation, or the US government bonds, US Treasury bonds, plus the risk premium. So what, is that, what does this mean? Well, all securities have the same inflation risk. Right? Bob and Charlie don't have any different inflation risk than the U.S.'s inflation risk. Brazil has its own inflation risks, right? But there's some risk amount that we're going to assign to everyone, right? Like the U.S. is 1.7%. Then we have to add a little bit more risk, to add a little bit more risk. So in the case of Steph Curry, we're going to say, all right, well, government bonds are 1.7%, so it has to be more than that. So it's going to be some percentage more than that, and it's going to equal some percentage. And we've decided arbitrarily, right? Arbitrarily that the 1.7%, we're gonna add 3.3% to equal 5%. And this is the inflation risk in essence. The inflation risk. And this is the opportunity risk. Opportunity cost. And this is a very theoretical concept. And part of it is based on how well Steph Curry can invest this money. <laughs> um, if he can't invest it very well, then we just have to think about, or we're going to assume he can't invest it at all. We're going to assume that it's, it's, it's some risk like the risk-free risk, plus this crazy risk that perhaps the NBA defaults or that Golden State tries to get him out of his contract or something like that. And if we use that, we can actually put in, refer to the discount rate here, down here, and we see that it's a lot closer to the 50 million. The only way it's worth 50 million is if the discount rate is zero. And it can't be zero, because there's some risk of default. There always is. There always is. Unless you have the money in your hands. And there's a lot of money to be made, this is a good question, which would never happen because the risk is irrelevant. A lot of fortunes are made a lot of fortunes are made and lost. In fact, I would say most fortunes are made and lost because someone correctly predicts that a very unlikely thing happens or doesn't happen. And that's sort of a big crux of finance. A good example is Warren Buffett with Coca-Cola in American Express and many of other Buffett stocks. He paid a large price for it. They did not seem to be cheap stocks when he bought them. They traded at 20 times, 30 times earnings. But he correctly predicted, and you could have bought other stocks for 15 times earnings, but unlike these stocks, he correctly predicted that they were not default. There would not be risk to these assets. They were, they were too protected by their brands and things like that. He called them moats. That 20, 30 years from now, Coca-Cola would still be selling more Coke than they did the year before, American Express, etc., etc. And then the opposite is always true. 
a lot of people value a company for 15 times earnings, and they say, well, there's not much risk that those earnings don't happen. And they're wrong. Sometimes things happen to earnings. A good example is a company like Best Buy or Valiant or, or other companies where earnings look really good and then all of a sudden they look really bad and you're left having paid a price that reflects that the earnings are going to be really good forever. So I hope we, we learned a little bit about finance today. There's, there's a lot to digest in this whole risk and uh, uh, sort of analyzing a dollar today and a dollar tomorrow. Um, all these things will take a lifetime to learn. I think I explained them briefly. I introduced you to the concept. When we do this again, we're gonna actually use uh, we're gonna actually use um, Blockbuster Video, a good example. Blockbuster Video. E even Netflix. Who knows? Is Netflix tomorrow's Blockbuster? Doesn't seem like it today. Back then, you would have never thought Blockbuster would have gone bankrupt. Uh, all of these things come and go, and, and the price we pay for things is, is very important because it implies a discount rate, and we'll learn all about these things. Uh, we'll, next, next lesson, we might do it in terms of formulas. This is the present value of an annuity is, is, happens in this formula. We can also do something like this. Or there's different formulas we can use, and eventually we're going to work our way up to something called a discounted cash flow or a discounted dividend model, which we basically did with Steph Curry's. Steph Curry, it's a more, more technical version of Steph Curry's uh, present value that we calculate. And remember, in Excel, you could just do equals, NPV, uh, discount rate, and then cash flow series. That's how you do it in Microsoft Excel. I don't know how to do it in any other application like Google or whatever. So again, we're gonna you're gonna spend a lifetime thinking about the the way to discount cash flows. That is the essence of business finance and investing. Um, I can't teach it to you in one lesson because it, it's gonna be a lifetime of experience and learning. And that's what, in essence, all of investing is all about: is what is the risk to your cash flow. Uh, but we can go back to public companies like Apple and do some more forecasting, and see kind of what likely is going to happen to investments and in, in public companies and private. Should we do some private stuff too? And we can try to discount um, and use examples and things like that. So I hope this is valuable for everyone. If anyone has any questions, I'll open it up for the next sort of five or 10 minutes and then we'll try to close by 10 and then I'll stick around and do some stuff after 10 as well, but the stream will end at 10 sharp. So anyone can join in. I'm gonna get a soda. So the mods yeah, can. That, that was a great, uh, really good, like, uh, I guess, fundamental explanation of cash flow. So I appreciate it. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks, sure. Norma. This is very informative. You feel free to dial in some people so we can get some questions while I go get my soda. Ah, uh, Billy. What's happening? Oh, God. What's up, dude? I just invested all my money. Mr. Trelly? No. Uh, he was saying how uh, what's his dick did uh, Coca Cola, thirty years and was like it's gonna grow for thirty years, and I was like that's awesome because you know no who would have thought Coca Cola would grow that much, and I did the exact same thing in um, hold on. Oh, little Debbie snack cakes. I think they're gonna grow exponentially every year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I put I put forty thousand dollars in little Debbie snack cakes. I think. This is, this is good for me. I'm excited. If anyone would know if he's, his snacks, it'd be Billy the Fridge. Anyone else? <laughs> Little Debbie's is it's a good name brand. I, I, commend, I commend Billy the Fridge's investment. <laughs> the Billy the Fridge snack cakes. <laughs> Starbucks. We talk about Starbucks a lot. We did a discounted cash flow for Starbucks recently. Martin, I, I've, I see that you're like... Uh, you're big on like finding the companies that are high PE that are still cheap. So like, is there a reason that you're attracted to these? I mean, lower PE the better, you know, less I have to pay to buy yeah, a company. It, it seems like you're like, uh, it seems like you're interested in like the ones that are high PE, but still are cheap. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think ti working at a Tiger Cub, all Tiger Cubs have this view that you know, it's not about PE, it's just about, you know, what's the present value and high growth companies, definitely, uh-oh, it's young Shkreli in the building. 
Dun 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 dun. High quality companies are often have high PEs, and that's why they have moats that protect them. Yeah. You know, Coca Cola is always traded at a high PE, um, but it's always it's always going to have its moat. Is Coca Cola be here 30, 40 years from now? I mean, you can bet your bottom dollar. In a world where there's very few certainties in this world, right? We don't yeah. know what the biggest computer maker is going to be in 20 years. We don't know what the biggest social network is going to be in five years. But, but, we, know, but we know Coke's going to be here. We know American Express is going to be here, most likely. We'll see. PayPal's coming around the corner. And we know there are some things that we can rely on as brands, right? Toothpaste. There's no yeah. technology that's going to change toothpaste in the next 20, 30 years. So we can, uh, we can value. It doesn't mean you always buy Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble. It means that if there's a discount to those stocks because of some crazy thing that's happening in the world, you can take advantage of that discount. So mm -hmm. IBM is a good example. IBM is trading at like eight times earnings, and Buffett loves it. I don't know anything about tech. But if there was a 3% you know, uh, uh, discount rate that went to an 8% discount rate for Procter & Gamble, I'd buy Procter & Gamble. And all of these things are pretty complicated. We'll, we'll get into it more and more and more. Reese? Yo. Uh, so I pretty, I pretty much, much understood, understood everything, everything except, except for uh, at, at the, the very end, end I was a little <coughs> uh, confused. So is the discount rate uh, like the the number that shows like an asset's value after you calculate the risk involved, or discount rate is how much you discount one year's cash flow from one year to the next? It's uh, like I said, discounts should actually the present value of a future cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. But it's <laughs> this guy is that young Trelly? Yes, of course. In the flesh. <laughs> Hilarious. This guy had all the answers, but his computer doesn't work. Chuck. Hey. Okay, Bye. boss. Talk, talk to you guys. How's it going, Chuck? I'm doing really good. How are you guys? Great. A little nervous. Nah. Just, oh, a, yeah. just a bunch of kids in here. Mr. Sprelly himself. Yeah. Good, good to talk to you. What's I, up? The reason I jumped in is it's a little off topic, but there's a story going on, off, off, around it. You got killed by uh, in a drive-by now. Turns out I'm still here. <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy story. Oh, hey, Martin. Hi. Great presentation. I'm a fellow uh, Ziglint graduate. And, uh, yeah, that, that was really great. I wanted to take a little off topic and talk about, like, the macroeconomics. No, the no, that no. You want to talk about that? What gives you the right to take my show and put it in a different direction? We have 13 minutes left of questions. Hi, Martin. Hi. Hi, I have a question. Right now, for the biofarm market in America, for you, what is your discount rate right now? Oh, that is a good question. Good question. Yeah. So, so drugs, um, drugs have very low discount rates typically. Um, you have obviously your inflation, uh, but typically it's like three or four percent, you know, discount rate because <laughs> typically, I'll give you a funny, funny example. Most people who start a prescription drug continue to take it for years and years and years to come. They're like annuities themselves. Uh, I take one prescription drug, I've taken it for literally 14 years in a row. 14 years in a row. That is as close to an annuity as you can get. That's better, I've, I've only been a T-Mobile customer for nine years. So what, for pharmaceutical- What do you take, you'll take, you'll take limitless? Yeah, I, I, take the, I, I got that limitless. Um, <laughs> but uh, the point is- uh, I like that. You have, it's a great business because you have your customers, they come back every month. Every month they come back for the same drug. So the only, there's a, there are risks. So you have to know each drug is different. If there's a competing drug coming out that is going to take a lot of market share, it still usually is not going to affect cash flow that much. If there's a cure okay. coming out, then you have to discount a little bit more. And that's, that's happened a few times where there was like a vastly superior drug that came out vastly, vastly superior, then you have to take a, a higher discount rate. Sometimes um, the discount rate is actually very low because you're planning on price increases, if you know anything about that. <laughs> um, sometimes you can plan those in advance and you have 
very low, potentially even no discount rate. Then you have your, your intellectual property, right? So you inevitably have an end to a, a drug. Drugs are very unusual. It's like no other business. You lose your monopoly eventually. And you fight and fight and fight to make sure you keep your monopoly forever. But eventually you completely, your patent is broken your, and, and uh, the drug goes generic. There are some drugs that don't go generic. Those are pretty cool. Um, and then what else? Because there's no other option. Well, there's, they, they, they can't, uh, the drugs that don't go generic are the ones that, um, uh, it and yeah, the FDA hasn't made a way for it to go generic, if that makes sense. When, when a company, so when when a company is a brand, uh, since they're, once they go off pen and they go generic, isn't the whole idea for them to um, ideally make a subsidiary to, to kind of be the top dog of that generic? Right, because, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, you definitely want to hold as much of the market share after the generics as possible. But typically, a lot of the big companies just give up and okay. uh, just let let the generic market do what it does. Um, but yeah, it's usually like a 3 4 5% discount rate, Quentin. So it's pretty low. Uh, once you have a drug FDA approved, it's you just sit there and let the, let the cash pile up, basically, um, yeah. until your patent expires, at least. Young no, Charlie, I see a pen in your hand. Are you taking notes as you, as you talk to this Mark? He doesn't need to take notes. Nah, no. Who is this guy? He's the boss. Hello. Um, so, so this, this might, might be, be uh, for your next um, your next uh, class, but uh, I have a question, question about, about uh, like, like dividends, dividends and pricing and stock. stock. Is, is that? that a fair, fair question, question, or would you prefer? I mean, I, the obviously, time. we didn't cover any of that material in this session. It sounds like you know right. a lot. You know a lot about finance. Are you a finance student, or? I mean, you kind of do. Yeah, I mean, you knew a lot of the. I saw you typing a lot of the comments. You were spot on. Um, we will talk about dividends and kind of theoretically, if a company doesn't pay any dividends ever, is it worth anything? That's something that is a pretty good theoretical question. A lot of the books would say no. Uh, clearly, real life suggests otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we got to think about that. Um, you know, dividends versus retaining cash versus buybacks. A lot of it's based on taxes. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that we got to talk about. But no, great to have you, and I hope you you join us for future shows. Yeah, um, I just have a quick question. Do you know how to change like your name through Blab? Do I look like Blab Technical Support? Yeah. <laughs> Your yeah, mother is up here. You need books? Here's one good book for you. Um, I don't want to first name my name. That sounds really generous of you. Can you not hear me? This is very noisy. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Things like current events. Too noisy, dude. Get out of here. Get out of here. Drive everyone crazy. Oh, it's quite. Again? Yeah, I have for No! <laughs> Don't do that. Hilbert. Wow. I'll kill you. Hey, Charlie, I'm not in a talking mood. Maybe next time. Your mic's off, Hilbert. We can't hear you. You talking, talking to me, me Charlie? Yeah, yeah I'm just hitting like you want my dick, bitch. I'm just, I'm just curious to know, like, you got you. I thought you were like a joke until I started hearing you ask good questions. I'm a real ass nigga. Don't worry about it. I want your Hi, Hunter. I don't know. I kind of do it when I have time. I just watch my Twitter, and then I do record these, so uh, right. so I am able to uh, upload you on, them. I have you on tweet notifications, so whatever. Yeah, the first one has been recorded and uploaded, and this one will be on there in a few minutes. Right. Thugs have feelings, too, according to Akil. They do. So we'll start trolling and going crazy in about seven minutes, don't worry. Uh, I'm really afraid to stand about. Your mic is off too. Why is like 60% of people's microphones off today? I don't understand. No, 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 I'm not going to one second you. You one second for me. <laughs> Just hold on one second. Solid. It's not a blast, <laughs> Okay. Um, I was wondering if things like... Um, which, Which presidential, presidential candidate is going to win, or like a Syrian refugee, refugee crisis, crisis, does that affect like um, rate or sure. risk? Sure. 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 
Yeah, no, I think I think uh, Democrats would give cash flows across the world a higher discount rate. Republicans would give them less. I mean, taxes and other yeah. things like that would shift dramatically over extremely long periods of time. I don't think it matters much, but political stability hugely important in forecasting cash flows. Venezuela, Argentina. I mean, half these countries have a new currency every five, ten years. You know, Ukraine. Could you imagine having Ukrainian cash flow? All right. All right. All messed up here on Blab. Yeah, gov government geopolitical risk, I think we call it geopolitical risk. Okay. So, hey, Mark, so you mentioned in the presentation that uh, U.S. government bond has zero risk, and I mentioned that that's absolutely not true. But it got me thinking, I mean, it's a little abstract, but does zero exist? Does zero risk exist? Like, is that, can that even, is that we'll have that, we'll have multiple lessons on that. I have a lot of, I've spent my whole life thinking about this concept and I think there, there is an answer to it. I don't want to share it right now just cause it's too, too complicated and sort of mystical even. Uh, it's almost like a religion to me. Um, I don't know that zero risk exists, but I don't think that's the question one has to ask. I think risk to cash flow is less about perceived risk and it's about actual risk. So if something doesn't default, did you ever risk anything? I mean, discount rates are really kind of very theoretical in a sense, right? I mean, if a bond is paying you $100 a year and you say, my bond to Maurice, the street guy, versus my bond to Charlie, the business owner, well, what happens if, if Maurice does pay you? Then it doesn't make a difference, right? You didn't, you might have, you might think you risked something, but if you got the money, it wasn't technically a risk. And we'll talk about that in the future. Hey, Mike. That's how you got to work out. Hey, Mike. Hi. Um, I was wondering, talking about Bloomberg uh, terminal. Uh, do you like Bloomberg? I know it costs my thousand dollars. Have you heard anything about Bloomberg and the new terminal coming up? In the news that only costs about like a thousand. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard about it. There have been Bloomberg alternatives for a long time, and Bloomberg's the the go-to. So if you have if you're, man, you're managing hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't really care how much your terminal costs. What do you think about the uh, negative interest rates in Japan? And do you think that we can do that here in the U.S. feasibly? Well, inflation, uh, I was thinking that for a while, and inflation just spiked up last month. Um, so there goes that idea. But sure, I mean, negative discount rates, that's a thats a concept we can talk about someday. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Do you think that's anything that could really be, I mean, what do you think would be the, what would be the ideal situation where we could... That's a that's Illuminati top secret stuff. When you have when you have ca cash flow at a negative discount rate, mm. Mm. think that through. It's not possible, is it? Or is it? All right, Daniel. I think your mic is off. We have just two minutes to go. And don't use the B word. You'll get you sued. Uh, Mark, what would you say is the most, most important thing, thing about running a business? <laughs> I don't think you can encapsulate it in one soundbite. Uh, when are we going to pay for the issues that we had in 2009 and 2008 that we never fixed? When you graduate from Baruch. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. You're done. <laughs> Done. Yeah, yeah so the formula you use in Excel, Excel uh, you know, you know how I said 43 million, million instead of 50 million. million. Is that, Is that assuming, assuming like you could, you could get, get the first 10 million, 10 million, million, 10 million and then it defaults and you don't, don't get, get the rest? rest? Or, or is it so, so like, like, you know what I mean? 
Nah. Not exactly. <laughs> Maybe just like go over it a few times. I think it'll sink in. It's like basically the what is the value of those cash flows if if you were to receive them in that order? What would the it, what's the present value today? If that makes sense. Right. It's it's definitely it takes a little while to sink in. You'll you'll get it. I have faith. Or not. Not everyone has to pass the class. <laughs> <laughs> have I, um, again, again. Um, um, so this one's about the uh, U.S. government, government the, uh, the default rate. rate. Um, um, so, so have you looked at the recent accounting papers, papers that the U.S. government just released um, with their assets and liabilities? Uh, and student loans are 32%. Well, those aren't. Are those federal? Those are assets. Oh, I see what you're saying. Over like billion and liabilities. And liabilities. Um, how would you count? Large, um, I'm not a I'm not a macro analyst. Yeah. There's there's certainly a possibility that the government defaults. I don't think it's likely, but um, yeah, it's a good question. You know, there are you can macro analysts look at country balance sheets all the time and decide decide that you know a country will go bankrupt. Um, you know, people did it in Greece and Ukraine and made a fortune. So you can certainly Japan is another example. You can certainly look at countries and decide they'll go bankrupt and bet against them. Anyway. Thanks so much, everyone. Two hours is up. Uh, I really appreciate you joining in, and uh, we'll see you next time.